Let's go back to right around the time the oil gusher happened, the explosion took place. Less than a week after BP's Deepwater Horizon drilling platform exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 workers and unleashing what could be the worst industrial environmental disaster in U.S. history, the company announced more than $6 billion in profits for the first quarter of 2010, more than doubling its profits from the same period the year before. Oil industry analyst Antonia Yuhas notes BP is one of the most powerful corporations operating in the United States. In 2009, revenues of $327 billion are enough to rank BP as the third largest corporation in the country. It spends aggressively to influence U.S. policy and regulatory oversight. Yes, the power and wealth that BP and other oil giants wield are almost without parallel in the world and pose a threat to the lives of workers, to the environment, and to our prospects for democracy. I'm reading for, from one of my latest columns. Um, today afterwards, I'll be signing copies of my book of columns called Breaking the Sound Barrier. And every week, the column appears in, oh, scores of newspapers and websites in this country and around the world. You can ask your local newspapers to run it. This piece was called BP, Billionaire Polluter. I've also seen BP referred to as beyond prosecution, but we'll get to that in a minute. Sixty years ago, BP was called the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. A popular progressive elected Iranian government had asked the AIOC, a largely British-owned monopoly, to share more of its profits from Iranian oil with the people of Iran. The company refused, so Iran nationalized its oil industry. That didn't sit well with the U.S., so the CIA organized a coup d'etat against Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. That coup which is all documented in history, the coup that was backed by the CIA, um, was carried out by Teddy Roosevelt's grandson, Kermit Roosevelt, who just brought with him suitcases of money and fomented this coup in Iran in 1953. If you are not Iranian here today, 1953 probably isn't particularly a year of note unless you were born in that year but for Iranians who were born before then and after. That is the seminal year, the year that their elected leader, their popular leader, Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, was deposed by the United States. After he was deposed, the Anglo-Iranian oil company, renamed British Petroleum, got a large part of its monopoly back, and the Iranians got the brutal Shah of Iran imposed upon them, planting the seeds of the, the, seeds of the 1979 Iranian Revolution, the subsequent hostage crisis, and the political turmoil that besets Iran to this day. In 2000, British Petroleum rebranded itself as BP, adopting a flowery green and yellow logo and began besieging the U.S. public with an advertising campaign claiming it was moving beyond petroleum. If only we could get there. BP's aggressive growth, outrageous profit, and track record of petroleum-related disasters paint a much different picture, however. In 2005, BP's Texas City refinery exploded, killing 15 people and injuring over 170. In 2006, a BP pipeline in Alaska leaked more than 200,000 gallons of crude oil, causing what the Environmental Protection Agency calls the largest spill that ever occurred on the Alaskan North Slope. BP was fined around $60 million for the two disasters combined. Then, in 2009, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, fined BP an additional $87 million for the refinery blast, you know, the one that killed 15 and wounded 170. Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis said, BP has allowed hundreds of potential hazards to continue unabated. Workplace safety is more than a slogan, it's the law. BP responded by formally contesting all of OSHA's charges. Now, President Obama, 
has said of the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, let me be clear, BP is responsible for this leak. BP will be paying the bill. Well, Ricky Ott is not so sure. She's a marine toxicologist and former fisher ma'am, as she calls herself, from Alaska. She was one of the first people to respond to the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil disaster. Exxon deployed an army of lawyers to delay and defeat the legal claims of the people who are physically and or financially harmed by the Valdez spill. Ricky said, what we know is that the industry does everything it can to limit its liability. I spoke to her the day she was leaving from Alaska to go to warn the people of the Gulf of Mexico. The Mobile Alabama Press Register reported that Alabama Attorney General Troy King told BP to stop circulating settlement agreements among coastal Alabamians. Apparently, BP was requiring owners of fishing boats seeking work mitigating the spill to waive any and all rights to sue BP in the future. Despite a BP spokesperson pledge that the waivers would not be enforced, even though they were going around getting them signed, the news report stated, King said late Sunday he was, he was still concerned that people would lose their right to sue by accepting settlements from BP of up to $5,000. And think what you'll do if you are desperate, if you've lost your livelihood, perhaps someone in your family died. Even if PP doesn't trick victims into signing away the right to sue, the 1990 Oil Pollution Act while requiring polluters to pay the actual hard cost of cleanup caps the additional financial liability of a spill at just $75 million. Given that millions of people will be impacted by the spill, by the loss of fisheries and tourism, and by the cascade of impacts on related industries, $75 million is small change. That's why Senator Robert Menendez, the Democrat from New Jersey, introduced a bill to raise the economic damages liability cap to $10 billion. He calls the bill the Big Oil, the Big Oil Bailout Prevention Act. Ricky uh, is touring New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, educating people about the toxic effects of the spill and helping them prepare for the long fight ahead to hold BP accountable. BP will surely continue its dirty practices fighting accountability in the courts, in the press, and on the oil-drenched beaches. BP, be prepared. Now, that bill has been prevented from going to the floor of the Senate at this point. The idea that the oil, the cap on their liability would not be increased to $10 billion is just astounding. Though a number of senators are calling for this, you have the Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, who's known as the drilling senator of Colorado before he was the Interior Secretary, got a tremendous amount of money from BP and campaign contributions, as, of course, did President Obama. It is very important that we also deal with campaign finance reform at the same time. How does what happened in the Gulf link to that? And now let's talk about another disaster. Massey, right before. Oil, gas, coal. By the way, as we talk about that, this, it is absolutely critical that we have a media in this country that is not brought to us by the oil, gas, and coal industry. When we're talking about issues from this disaster in the Gulf of Oil to global warming, it's absolutely critical that we have a media in this country that's not brought to us by the weapons manufacturers when we're talking about global warming. It's critical we have a media in this country that is not brought to us by the insurance industry and big pharma when we're talking about the issue of health care, the crisis of health care, and the lack that people have access to health care in this country. We need a media in this country that is independent. Massey. 
It's hard even to remember what happened in West Virginia as it's eclipsed by what's happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Massey Energy runs the upper big branch mine in Montcole, West Virginia, where 29 miners were killed in April. The loss of life tragic, but the UBB, that's upper big branch explosion, is more than tragic. It's criminal. When corporations are guilty of crimes, however, they don't go to prison. They don't forfeit their freedom. They just get fined, which often amounts to a slap on the wrist, the cost of doing business. No one makes this clearer than the CEO of Massey Energy, Don Blankenship. He's been the bane of climate change activists and mine safety advocates for years. This latest mine disaster, if nothing else, will surely bring needed attention to this poster boy from malevolent big business trampling on communities, the environment, and workers' rights. Days after the Massey explosion, Blankenship admitted in a radio interview, violations are unfortunately a normal part of the mining process. There are violations at every coal mine in America, and UBB was a mine that had violations. Well, the Charleston, West Virginia Gazette has consistently reported critically on Massey Energy and Blankenship, prompting him to attack its editors in a November 2008 speech, saying... It is as great a pleasure to me to be criticized by the communists and the atheists of the Gazette. Would we be upset if Osama bin Laden were to be critical of us? I don't think so, he said. Initial speculation on the cause of the explosion is methane in the mine. The Massey UBB mine has received thousands of citations for violations, including many for failing to remove the methane with ventilation. Another cause may be the mine's proximity to Massey mountaintop removal operations. Mountaintop removal involves the massive blasting away of mountaintops, providing access to seams of coal, but causing widespread destruction of the environment. The Wall Street Journal reported that a West Virginia state investigation into the explosion will include possible impact of the nearby mountaintop mining operations. EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson issued new rules restricting mountaintop removal April 1st, just days before the Massey explosion. Massey is the principal target of a growing grassroots campaign against mountaintop removal. Among those arrested at protests have been renowned climate scientist James Hansen, director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and actress Daryl Hannah. 16 miners died in Massey Mines between the years 2000 and 2007. Elvis Hatfield and Don Bragg were killed January 2006 in the Aracoma mine fire. Their widows sued Massey Energy and Blankenship. At the trial, their lawyers presented a memo written by Blankenship months before the fatal fire, instructing his deep mine superintendents to focus on extracting coal over safety projects. He wrote, if any of you have been asked by your group presidents, your supervisors, engineers, or anyone else to do anything other than run coal, like build overcast, do construction jobs, or whatever, you need to ignore them and run coal. This memo is necessary only because we seem not to understand that the coal pays the bills, he said. Blankenship poured three, uh, well, coal pays the bills and pays Blankenship's salary which estimated by the Associated Press at $19.7 million is the highest in the coal industry. Blankenship is a board member of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He's a fierce opponent of organized labor, a relentless denier of climate change, and a staunch opponent of regulation. He said of government regulators last Labor Day at an anti-union rally, the very idea that they care more about coal miner safety than we do is as silly as global warming. Blankenship poured $3 million into the election campaign of a candidate for the West Virginia Supreme Court in order to replace a sitting judge who he feared would rule against Massey in an appeal against a $50 million judgment. The candidate he backed, Brent Benjamin, won the seat and voted to overturn the judgment. The U.S. Supreme Court overturned that decision, citing Blankenship's funding of the election, and the case served as the basis of John Grisham's 2008 legal thriller, The Appeal. Pension funds and other large institutional investors are demanding Massey fire Blankenship. The last of the 29 bodies of the miners killed in the Massey mine have been recovered. Their deaths should not be counted by Don Blankenship as the cost of doing business, but rather should top his criminal indictment. Now,
The other night, I went to the Ms. Foundation Awards for young women doing remarkable things around the country, and I met one of the directors of Law and Order SVU, the Sexual Victims Unit. Um, and you know Law and Order, the mothership show that's been on for a couple decades, is now ending, though Law and Order SVU will continue. And I said to her, I said to her, this would be the perfect time to come up with another spin-off. You could have Law and Order SVU and Law and Order CCU. That's Law and Order Corporate Crime Unit. You know how they go, bing, bing, 217 West 14th Street, the police run in and they capture the person who they believe was involved with the murder. Well, they could do the very th same thing, their hands covered with oil, and they've got, you know, the CEO of BP and saying, we understand, sir, we've got the evidence that this is linked directly to you. Slap handcuffs on. Imagine, if we lived in a country of law and order, there would not be a question here. This was my latest column. Manslaughter reads the United States Code as the unlawful killing of a human being without malice. It goes on, whoever's guilty of involuntary manslaughter shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than six years or both. In the disasters at the Massey coal mine in West Virginia and on the BP oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico, people were killed. 29 miners died in the Upper Big Branch mine explosion. 11 workers died on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig, which is owned by Transocean, working under contract for BP with uh, work from Halliburton in there as well. There are state laws that govern manslaughter as well and special language given for maritime deaths. So why aren't these executives of companies behind bars? Yes, these two disasters bring into sharp focus the need to reduce our national addiction to fossil fuels. The Gulf oil eruption, for that's what it is, not a spill, not a leak, but the unleashing of a hugely powerful jet of oil and gas under enormous pressure a mile beneath the ocean surface is likely to become the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history. What's the latest? Four million gallons of oil a day are being spewed forth in a volcano of oil on the ocean's floor, on the Gulf's floor. Mike Williams, the chief electronics technician of the Transocean oil rig, detailed on 60 Minutes, how many of you saw 60 Minutes last week? It was powerful, moving testimony of this whistleblower of Mike Williams. He talked about the negligence of both Transocean uh, tra and BP in the lead up to the blowout. He said a mistake was made during a pressure test which damaged a critical safety gasket or annular. Later, a crew member reported finding chunks of the rubber gasket in the effluent that surfaces during the drilling process. The gasket is part of the blowout preventer, another BP which is the device on the ocean floor atop the well that's supposed to serve as the fail-safe to prevent exactly the type of catastrophe that's unfolding now. There's also uh, was a known electrical failure on the blowout preventer. Williams also detailed an argument aboard the Deepwater Horizon rig between the Transocean manager and the BP manager. Ultimately, the BP manager prevails because they're in charge of the whole operation. Transocean had been hired to drill the hole and to plug it until BP returned to begin oil extraction. The argument involved how best to plug the hole. Transocean, Williams recounted, wanted to leave a heavy mud-like substance in the well shaft to help the concrete plugs installed by Halliburton stay in place. BP wanted the substance removed ostensibly to expedite the later extraction. As Robert B. put it, the engineer at University of California, Berkeley, um, who has been called into every spill and disaster, including Katrina, to investigate, as he put it, BP-1. He told this to 60 Minutes. The concrete plugs failed, the damaged blowout preventer failed as well, and the disaster soon followed. So this week on Tuesday, I called Russell McIver. He's editor of the Corporate Crime Reporter. He lives in West Virginia. He joined several hundred protesters Tuesday in Richmond, Virginia, where Massey Energy was holding its first annual shareholder meeting since the explosion at the Upper Big Branch Mine. 
After the mine explosion and the resulting death of 29 miners, activist shareholders have been organizing to unseat the Massey Board of Directors. As the extremely contentious meeting began, two protesters in a balcony unfurled a banner reading, Massey, stop putting profits over people. McIver thinks Massey executives should be prosecuted for manslaughter. After protesting outside the shareholders' meeting, he told me, if I drive my car 90 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour speed zone and I accidentally kill someone, I'm going to be charged with involuntary manslaughter for behaving with reckless disregard for those around me. Prosecutors regularly bring these cases, he said. If a corporation operates a workplace with reckless disregard for the safety of the workers and those workers die as a result, those executives responsible should be prosecuted. He said that's why why we're calling on the prosecutor of Raleigh County, West Virginia, to bring this charge against Massey Energy and its responsible executives. According to the Associated Press, federal prosecutors say they're investigating whether there was willful criminal activity related to the Upper Big Branch Mine. BP also should face a criminal investigation, which is what a number of senators are also calling for right now. We need to pierce the corporate veil while the civil lawsuits that will follow are likely to cost these companies some money. That is ultimately considered just the cost of doing business. When workers are killed to save time or because of unsafe working conditions, when livelihoods and the environment are destroyed, executives who make these decisions must be personally held accountable. And there is hope all over the world from Copenhagen, and I'm not talking about the final decision, the final accord, but the thousands, the tens of thousands of people who gathered there from all over the world, amassing a movement together, recognizing across borders, often against their government's unwillingness to take on the corporate powers in their countries, amassing together to say, if we're going to save this planet, we got to do it together. We were in Copenhagen. For those of you who watch or listen to Democracy Now! or read it online at democracynow.org, you heard our two weeks of broadcast. We were the only daily national broadcast every day for an hour broadcasting from the Global Climate Change Summit. And then we went from Copenhagen in December to Earth Day week in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Because there too, thousands of people, mainly indigenous people from throughout Latin America had gathered once again. Because of the failed Copenhagen Accord, they came to Bolivia to demand global action on an issue that is threatening their lives. Here in this small Andean nation of Bolivia, I wrote that week, a nation of 10 million people, the glaciers are melting, threatening the water supply of the largest urban area in the country. El Alto and La Paz with three and a half million people living at altitudes of over 10,000 feet. I flew from El Alto International, the world's highest commercial airport, to the city of Cochabamba. Bolivian President Evo Morales, we'll get to Rand Paul in a minute, but he was one of the first leaders he attacked in his victory speech in Kentucky. Evo Morales was his target. Bolivian President Evo Morales called Cochabamba the heart of Bolivia. It was there 10 years ago in April that, as one observer put it, the first rebellion of the 21st century took place. In what was dubbed the Water Wars, people from around Bolivia converged on Cochabamba to overturn the privatization of the public water system. Ten years ago in the year 2000, right after the Battle of Seattle in Seattle. As Jim Schultz, founder of the Cochabamba-based Democracy Center, told me, people like a good David and Goliath story, and the water revolt is David, not just beating one Goliath, but three. We call them the three Bs, Bechtel, Banzer, and the bank. 
The World Bank, Schultz explained, coerced the Bolivian government under President Hugo Banzer, who'd ruled as a dictator in the 70s, to privatize Cochabamba's water system. The multinational corporation based in San Francisco, Bechtel, the sole bidder, took control of the public water system. Well, just a few weeks ago, I was walking around the Plaza Principal in central Cochabamba with Marcela Oliveira, who was out on the streets 10 years ago. I asked her about the movement's original banger, banner that was hanging for the anniversary. It said in Spanish, el agua es nuestra carajo, the water is ours, damn it. Bechtel was jacking up water rates. The first to notice were the farmers dependent on irrigation. They appealed for support from the urban factory workers. Oscar Oliveira, Marcella's brother, was their leader. He proclaimed at one of their rallies, if the government doesn't want the water company to leave the country, the people will throw them out. Marcella told the story of what happened 10 years before, in 2000. She said, on February 4th, we called the people to a mobilization. We called it La Toma de la Plaza, the takeover of the plaza. People were meeting from all over. The city was shut down by the coalition of farmers, factory workers, and coca growers, known as the cocaleros. Unrest and strikes spread to other cities during a military crackdown in state of emergency declared by Banzer. 17-year-old Victor Hugo Daza was shot in the face and killed amid public furor. Bechtel fled the city and its contract with the Bolivian government was canceled. The Cocoleros played a crucial role in the victory. Their leader was Evo Morales. The Cochabamba water wars would eventually launch him into the presidency of Bolivia. At the UN Climate Summit in Copenhagen, he called for the most rigorous action on climate change. After the summit, Bolivia refused to support the US-brokered non-binding Copenhagen Accord. Bolivia's ambassador to the UN, Pablo Salon, told me that as a result, he said, we were notified by the media that the United States was cutting around three to three and a half million dollars for projects that have to do with climate change. Instead of taking USAID money for climate change, Bolivia is taking a leadership role in helping organize civil society and governments globally with one goal, to alter the course of the next major UN climate summit set for Cancun, Mexico in December. It's very interesting what took place. We're at this huge Earth Day rally in Cochabamba, and the Ecuadorian foreign minister also spoke. The US punished Ecuador as well. And uh, cut off two and a half million dollars of aid in Ecuador that was meant for climate change projects because they wouldn't sign on to the accord if you're wondering how democracy works. If they won't sign on, they're punished. Well, the foreign minister of Ecuador said he would give the United States two and a half million dollars to sign on to the Kyoto Protocol. So 15,000 people came from around the planet to Cochabamba on that Earth Day week in April at the People's World Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. Morales called for the gathering to give the poor and the global south an opportunity to respond to the failed climate talks. Ambassador Salon, he is the only Bolivian ambassador to the United States. He's the ambassador to the United Nations. The United States kicked out the Bolivian ambassador to the United States. Um, Salon said, people are asking me how this is coming from a small country like Bolivia. I'm the ambassador to the UN. I know this institution. If there's no pressure from civilian society, change will not come from the UN. The other pressure on governments comes from transnational corporations. In order to counteract that, we need to develop a voice from the grassroots. That is a challenge for all. And so we go from global warming, from this crisis of dependence on fossil fuels to Rand Paul. Yes, that victory address he gave in Bowling Green, the voice of the people at an exclusive country club. That's where his victory address was in Bowling Green. And he stood there. I don't know if people actually listened to the speech. We played a good part of it. It's very short on Democracy Now! And you can go to democracynow.org to check it out. But there he attacked Evo Morales and President Obama for even going to Copenhagen. All of this, he said, challenged capitalism challenge capitalism. His most recent comments are that President Obama is wrong to have his boot on the neck of BP. 
And now let's talk about what else he said. What else he said this week as he backtracked pretty quickly uh, on the issue of civil rights, the Civil Rights Act, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, which isn't talked about quite as much. But as he was questioned just after his victory about whether he would support the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and he said parts of it he would, that he's against institutional racism. But when it came to forcing private companies, because federal government is the boogeyman, is the bad guy, that's where he would draw the line. He's not the only person who believes this. I mean, this is what we have to understand is meant when you talk about making government smaller. Whether we're talking about not regulating these oil giants who often have uh, budgets that are larger than the countries around the world, or whether we're talking about changing policy and practice in this country because of discrimination. He said public institutions, that's fine but not private institutions, to which NPR and uh, Rachel Maddow and MSNBC and one network after another started to say, wait, so what about the lunch counter sit-ins? You would have been against them. Woolworths can have a segregated counter. On Democracy Now! the next day, we went to North Carolina, to Durham, Raleigh, North Carolina, and talked to uh, North Carolina State University professor Blair Kelly. Uh, Watch the show. Uh, my, Blair Kelly and Mike Irvin from here in Chicago, very active disability rights activists from ADAPT. We asked them both to respond to what Rand Paul was saying. Um, Professor Kelly wrote, Right to Ride, Streetcar Boycotts and African American Citizenship in the Era of Plessy v. Ferguson. I asked her about what Rand Paul was saying. She said, what concerns me is the notion that this legislation is meaningless in terms of our contemporary society and that this history is something we should forget about or move past, that the notion of this hard separation between public and private actually makes sense in light of the lived experiences of African Americans at the time. She said, to imagine a world where African Americans could just deal with public institutions and be excluded from private businesses that are open to the public, the white public, and yet cutting them out was really profound. She said, imagine traveling as an African American during the Jim Crow era. You would not be able to stop for a restroom. You would not be able to find food to feed your kids. You might not be able to find lodging to stay overnight. And so many African Americans had to seek out black institutions to help them as they traveled. They had to go to their local black college where they were on that journey and try and ask them for food and somewhere to stay. This was sort of central to their experience. So if we can imagine that American citizens didn't have the freedom to travel as they wanted to with dignity, respect, that they could not anticipate what kind of treatment they would get from place to place and day to day, imagine raising children in that kind of context. Imagine trying to stay safe then. So she said, for me, for that history to be discounted as unimportant and not meaningful is really not a reflection of how horrible Jim Crow segregation actually was and how much we have to remember it and guard against having any kind of extension of discrimination or any sense that companies serving the public should be able to choose what part of the public they want to serve. And then I asked Mike Irvin, Mike, who spent a good deal of effort and time to get into the studio in Chicago on Friday morning to talk about his response to what Rand Paul had to say. You know, at Democracy Now!, we're deeply committed to bringing you historical context. Because let's face it, when you say the Civil Rights Act, 1964, half of our listeners weren't even born then. And even if you were, what does it mean to you? We just say Civil Rights Act, but what was the struggle it was born out of and what did it actually mean for people in this country? Where you have Rand Paul saying these are sort of academic distinctions, private, public. They're not academic when you're driving on a highway and you can't stop anywhere when you're threatened if you try to eat something. And so we asked Mike Irvin here in Chicago to respond, to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act, how it got passed, and what he thought of what Rand Paul had to say. Um, Rand Paul, by the way, in responding to Robert Siegel on, um, on All Things Considered, said, 
I think a lot of this could be handled locally. For example, he said, I think that we should try to do everything we can to allow people with disabilities and handicaps. He said, we do it in our office with wheelchair ramps and things like that. I think if you have a two-story office and you hire someone who's handicapped, it might be reasonable to let them have an office on the first floor rather than the government saying you have to have a $100,000 elevator. And he went on to talk about that, that the federal government shouldn't be making decisions for local business. So this was Mike Irvin's response. He said, yeah, basically what he's saying is that every private business has the right to say, we don't want you in here, get out of here. And we're getting back to the old lunch counter problem again. Yeah, I think that most people would disagree with him quite significantly, that little steps, which are often all that is required, little steps should, no affirmative steps should have to be taken at all to make it possible for someone who uses a wheelchair or someone who uses a service animal. Should a private sort of person who owns a restaurant or a store be able to say to a blind person who needs a dog to get around, get out of here, no dogs in my store or restaurant, and thus tell the blind person they can't come in? Are those the kinds of things he's talking about? Should the cab company that makes money operating in my city be able to say, we don't want to have any wheelchair accessible vehicles and we don't care if you get around just like everybody else? Is that really the kind of thing he's talking about? Um, and he went on to say, when I asked him about how his life has changed over the last 20 years since the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, was passed in 1990. And I thought, it's interesting to share it with you here living in Chicago. He said, well, for someone in the middle of the city like me, the first thing you can point to is transportation, both public and private. In 1992, we had our very first accessible, wheelchair accessible bus in Chicago. Up until that point, I couldn't ride public transit at all. There were no taxi cabs that were wheelchair accessible in Chicago at the time. Now there are about 100 of them. I still can't get on all the public transit systems here in Chicago because some of them are old and haven't been made accessible yet by the ADA. And he went on to say that that argument about forcing a private company that might not have the money to build a $100,000 elevator, he said, this is the old uh, um, argument that doesn't fit into the ADA because they say you have to make all reasonable efforts. And he said, actually saying someone could work on the first floor is a reasonable effort. And he said that's often used to scare businesses into thinking that they'll go bankrupt if they change their ways. It's so important we have a media that hears people speaking for themselves. The power of that is inestimable. Um, 40 years ago, last week, on May 12, 1970, the fourth Pacifica station, KPFT, you know, Pacifica is made up of five stations. It's the oldest independent uh, radio network in this country, founded in 1949 by a war resistor named Lou Hill, who when he came out of the detention camps in California said there's got to be a media outlet not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And so Pacifica was born, the first station, KPFA in Berkeley, then KPFK in Los Angeles, then my station, BAI in New York, then KPFT in Houston, March 1970. On May 12th, two months into its operation, it became the only radio station in the country to be blown up. It was blown up by the Ku Klux Klan. They strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. Why? Well, I believe it's because of that mission to bring out the voices of people speaking for themselves because that's what challenges hate when you hear someone describing their own experience. I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, because I often confuse their titles. <laughs> but he said it was his proudest act, because he knew how dangerous true independent media is, because people are speaking their own truths. And I don't say there is one truth, but they're sharing their own experiences. And when you hear a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, when you hear an uncle from Afghanistan or an aunt from Iraq, it changes the way you see the world. You don't have to agree with them, but you might say, it sounds like my bubba, it sounds like my baby, it sounds like my aunt and my uncle. And that challenging of stereotypes and caricatures 
is what challenges the hate groups like the KKK. That's more important than ever today. And as I talk about hearing a Palestinian child, it's unfortunate that Noam Chomsky couldn't on his most recent trip uh, to the Middle East this past week. And those of you who didn't get to hear Democracy Now! on Monday, I do encourage you to. The world-renowned linguist, the well-known political dissident, the author of more than 100 books, was trying to make his way from Amman into the West Bank, where he had been invited to give two lectures at Brzeit University. The Israeli authorities turned him back. They stamped on his passport and the passport of his daughter, Salem State Professor Avi Chomsky, denied entry. It's very important that we be able to engage in a global conversation. It should not be ideas that are dangerous. What's dangerous is when states, when countries try to stop us from talking about the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death. I only have a few minutes, but I wanted to talk about a lawsuit that um, we've brought in the last few weeks. Uh, uh, my colleagues at Democracy Now! and I, uh, Nicole Salazar, Sharif Abdel Kadus and I, have brought against the city of St. Paul, the Twin Cities, in fact, for our arrests at the Republican Convention in the summer of 2008. Because it's very serious and it goes to this issue of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. It was the first day of the Republican Convention, Labor Day 2008. The morning started bright blue day with a major protest before the convention would begin later in the day. And by the way, there were these protests in Denver at the Democratic Convention as well. They were protests against war. 10,000 people marched from St. Paul City Hall to the Excel Center where the convention would take place, led by soldiers, some in full military uniform. And that's very bold and courageous of them. They faced serious sanction. Some of them had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, others had resisted, but they wanted to stop this country from engaging in war. And so they marched, we covered the protest, and then I went off to the convention center to talk to the delegates from all of the states. Most interestingly at the time were the delegates from the hottest state, Alaska. Um, and so I was interviewing the delegates and my other colleagues had gone off to digitize tape. And then I got a call from our senior producer, Mike Burke. He said, come quickly to 7th and Jackson. Nicole and Sharif have been arrested and they're hurt. I said, what are you talking about? So we raced off the convention floor. I was there with Big Noise Films cameraman Rick Rowley, who's in Afghanistan. I hope you heard his latest report on Democracy Now! We raced down the streets. We got to 7th and Jackson. It was completely cordoned off by the uh, riot police. Um, they had the area fully contained. They were in a line along the street. So I ran up, you know, I had all my credentials, my. Uh, uh, top security credentials that allow me to interview presidents and vice presidents and delegates. And um, I ran up, I said, you know, I said my name, I said, uh, I'm a credentialed journalist. I was just at the convention and two of our producers are inside. They're credentialed like I am. We need to have them released. It wasn't seconds before they ripped me through that line, twisted my arms back, slapped handcuffs on me, pushed me up against the wall and onto the ground. They arrested me. They charged me with misdemeanor, with interfering with a peace officer. If only there was a peace officer in the vicinity. <laughs> and I was now very concerned. I was concerned that my colleagues, I couldn't see them anywhere. I knew they had been hurt. I was demanding to see them. Then I saw Sharif across the parking lot. He was standing with his hands behind his back. His arm was bloodied. I demanded to be brought to him. Finally, they did bring me to him. We were both standing with our handcuffs and with both of our credentials hanging around our neck. We were demanding to be released, saying, you know we're journalists. We demand to be released, whereupon the Secret Service came and ripped the credentials from around our necks. Um, then they brought me into the police wagon. I, there was Nicole, credential around her neck. Uh, her, she was handcuffed and her arm, face was bloodied. She quickly described to me what had happened. She said they'd been digitizing tape in the TV studio that afternoon and they heard a commotion outside and then they just did their job. If they hadn't gone downstairs when they heard a commotion, that would have been the problem. 
They grabbed camera, microphone, they raced downstairs. The, there were protesters, there were police. She's filming uh, what was happening. And then suddenly, the riot police came directly at her. She hadn't gone down to film her own violent arrest, but that's ended up what's happened. The police are racing at her and they are shouting, on your face, on your face. She is filming, holding up her press pass and shouting back, press, press. You can hear this on the videotape. And they take her down on her face. Camera tumbles down. First thing they do is take the camera out of her, the battery out of her camera, if you're wondering what they didn't want to happen. They have her down on the ground, face on the ground. They've got a knee or boot in her back. They're dragging on her legs, so it's bloodying her face. Sharif is a very cool guy. He's telling them to calm down. They take him, they throw him up against the wall, they kick him twice in the chest, and they take him down. They were facing felony riot charges. So I'm taken off to the police garage where the cages were erected for the protesters, and I am processed. Police are yelling at me, and Sharif and Nicole are taken off to jail. The videotape of our arrest went online immediately, and it went viral. It was the most watched videotape on YouTube of the Republican convention for the first two days of the convention, and the response was tremendous. It was electric. I mean, the response of the grassroots, I think, is what freed us ultimately after a number of hours. I got out, and they eventually got out to show the power of that protest. Sharif was in a cell with the AP photographer, who was not released at that time, but Sharif was. When we got out, I was immediately taken to the convention. I was on the, in the NBC skybox. They were interviewing me, uh, asking what had happened. And when the camera was turned off, the NBC producer, reporter, who was standing next to me and listening, he turned to me and he said, I don't get it. Why wasn't I arrested? And I said, oh, were you covering the protest outside? And he said, no. I said, well, I'm not being arrested in the skybox either. Um, you know, like Woody Allen says, 90% of life is just showing up. You got to get out there, and it's our job to do that. We have to be on the convention floor, find out what the orchestrated message is, and even the division among the delegates. We got to get into those corporate suites to see which oil company is sponsoring which senator's association or uh, campaign campaign finance committee, whether it's Republican or Democrat. I don't know how many doors were slammed in my face as I would reach for the strawberries or the hors d'oeuvres trying to say, who's sponsoring this cocktail party? <laughs> um, but our job is also to be in the streets. That's where the uninvited guests are, where thousands of people had gathered to share their message as well. And we shouldn't have to get a record by putting things on the record. The next day, I went off to the police news conference. The police chief, John Harrington, was very proud of the police operations up until that point. You know that week they arrested more than 40 journalists, and Sharif was arrested on the last night of the convention as well, covering the protests. So I said to him, I stood up at the news conference, and I said to police chief Harrington, I described what happened to the three of us, and I said, what have you instructed your police to do? And how do you expect us as reporters to operate in this environment? He said we could embed, embed in the mobile field force, the police mobile field force. You understand what he's saying? You know the model of recovering war in Iraq and Afghanistan, reporters embedded in the front lines of troops? They are now using that to cover American cities. We too are to embed in the police department. Now, it is absolutely critical that we have an independent media. I'm not saying the reporters who embed in the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan aren't brave. But what are you going to get from that perspective? You're eating with the troops, you're sleeping with the troops, your life is in their hands. You're going to get one perspective, and that is from the trigger end of the gun. We have to be at the target end as well. What does it mean, it mean to be embedded in Iraqi communities and Afghan hospitals, to be embedded in the peace movement around the world? This would give us the full repercussions and effects of war. Because only then, especially as American journalists, when we bring out these images, will people be able in this country to make a decision, an informed decision about where and how we should operate in the world. Could you imagine if for just one week, the top of every newscast in this country, above the fold of every surviving newspaper in this country, 
were the images of war. And the top of every website, the photographs of babies dead on the ground, the pictures, the video of women with their legs blown off by cluster bombs, the pictures of soldiers dead and dying. If for just one week, 24 hours a day, we saw those images, Americans would say no. War is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. Democracy Now! <laughs>